welcome to our webinar about prototyping for the connected home. In today's session, we're going to dive into the exciting world of IoT prototyping, which enables you to turn your ideas into groundbreaking smart home designs. Before we kick off, uh, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. So head over to, um, to the chat and let us know. Make sure to enable everyone when you send your messages in the Zoom chat box. Okay. Yeah, I just noticed I'm not sharing. There you go. So let's see. San Francisco. Hi. San Jose, Portugal, Honduras. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Nelly. It's good to have you here. So yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for whatever you're joining us from. It's currently uh, a early, an early morning here in Seoul, South Korea, where I'm currently based. Let's see. Finland. Finland, that must be really early morning <laughs> right there. Okay, let's see. 2 a.m. Oh, thank you for joining <laughs> for at that time. That's really, that's really great that you were able to join. Okay, so while our guests join, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Yulia. I'm a customer success manager here at Protopi, and today I'll be your host. Now let's meet today's uh, speakers, shall we? Allow me to introduce you to my colleague, Rebecca Kuridas. She's also a customer success manager here at Protopi, and she's here to give you a short introduction to the world of Protopi, as well as some of our most exciting product updates. Rebecca, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. Nice to see all of you here. Thank you, Rebecca. Right, now let's see. Uh, I am excited to tell you that today's webinar features Vivint. Vivint is a top smart home solutions provider uh, serving millions of households across the United States and Canada. Their um, advanced uh, technology seamlessly integrates home security and automation, providing more secure and more convenient and also um, remarkably more comfortable homes. Uh, allow me to introduce you to Nathan Moss who is a senior UX designer at Vivint, and Michelle Zandel, who is the director of UX design at Vivint. Michelle and Nathan, do you want to say hi? Yeah, how's it going? Thanks for joining us today. It'll be exciting. Hey, everybody. Excited for uh, answering your Q&A questions at the end. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle and Nathan. Now, let's see today's agenda. Um, so Rebecca will start with a short intro to Protopi and she'll also share some of our latest updates with you because uh, we do have some updates. And uh, yeah, Nathan will then take it, over, take it over to show you how they use prototyping at Vivint to revolutionize smart home design. And we will wrap up with a live Q&A who will be led by Michelle and uh, Nathan. So stay tuned. I would encourage all of you to participate in the Q&A to make sure that we make the most out of today's webinar. So feel free to ask any questions you have in the Zoom uh, Q&A window, and we will address them at the end. Uh, okay, then, without further delays, let's uh, let's dive right into it. Rebecca, I will stop my share. There you go. Up. Hey, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Yep. Hey. Okay, hello everybody. It's great to be here. I'm gonna just shortly uh, introduce Protopi and also the amazing features that we uh, released recently. So, um, so Protopi was actually created um, with the intention to allow designers to bring their ideas to life, to also uh, validate and iterate uh, their design concepts before going to the uh, development uh, stage. So yeah, we're trying to put ourselves there uh, in the market as a really um, a high fidelity prototyping tool. So Protopi is not only an, uh, just one platform, but it's a whole ecosystem. Why? Because um, we include different spaces. Let me explain you first. First, we have Protopi Studio to where you can actually uh, import your designs from your favorite uh, design tools, such as Figma, uh, Adobe XD, and Sketch. And you can bring them directly to Studio 
And then you can start adding your uh, intended interactions there. And like, that's where all the magic happens, right? And also like all the prototypes that are made with Protopy can be tested on the target device uh, using the Protopy player. And we're not talking only about um, mobile, tablet, or laptops. We're also talking about um, extending this to more like advanced devices. And this uh, can be achieved with the help of Protopy Connect. With Protopy Connect, you can actually try smartwatch, TV, uh, Logitech T29, and more. And it doesn't end there because we also know that collaboration features are very important, right, for your um, workflow. So we also have Protopy Cloud. In Protopy Cloud, what you can do is first, you save your prototypes there. You can share them easily with your stakeholders. And also you can create handoffs that will be later uh, hand to developers. And we also have a, a feature, um, user testing, that is still in beta for some enterprise users. But yeah, we have this option in Protopy Cloud as well. Now, uh, as we in Protopy, we always aim, right, to become a better tool and to help you um, make your prototypes look more like the final product, we're always adding uh, new features. So for example, on our last uh, release, we added the barcode scanner before we had uh, the QR code scanner. So now uh, we enhance this scanner feature and you can actually choose this only using uh, your camera in your device. So I'm gonna show you a short video of how this feature works. Let me show you how easy it is to make a multi-device delivery experience with Protopy. The driver has arrived. We'll continue the experience on the phone. All it takes is a simple message and the delivery is handed off. We use a smartphone to scan the package. Just add a camera layer into a barcode scanner. It's delivered. The tablet gets the message and so does the smartwatch. Multi-device and scanning interaction protopy. Start learning. So yeah, this, as you saw, you could also connect like different devices. And this is also thanks to Protopy Connect, which is a, a companion of the uh, Protopy. And- Let me show you how sorry. easy it is to make a multi- Then we also have these other new features, for example, uh, custom ESIM presets. So we try to uh, go a step farther on um, using ESIM presets. So we allow you now to customize them. So you can also save these customized ESIM presets and reuse them. Moreover, what you can do is actually share this with your other uh, team members because you can uh, export them and import them also into new uh, into other computers. Now, uh, audio recording in preview. Actually, a prototype uh, is not complete unless you can show uh, its full interactivity, right? So now you are uh, able to record sound in your prototype not only the sound that comes from your prototype, but also you can add uh, external sound. Uh, for example, in case you want to narrate your prototype while right, you see you show the interactions there. And then we also have this very requested um, feature, custom fonts. For now, it's only part of this enterprise plan, but don't worry, we're gonna try to make it available for uh, all of our users later. Uh, but yeah, as we know, like, uh, different organizations, they, they have different kinds of fonts, right? And the problem that they faced, it was like they could not uh, keep the same fonts throughout uh, all their prototypes whenever they share them. So now this has been fixed. Now you can consistently uh, share these fonts and also uh, these will be displayed uh, throughout uh, the whole Protopy ecosystem. Now, Handoff in a studio, as I explained, Handoff is actually one of our main uh, collaboration features. And we have made it uh, more accessible because we added a um, direct button in the studio, in Protopy Studio. So when you're done with your prototypes and you're ready to share with your developers, all you have to do is just click on the top uh, on that button, hand off, and it will uh, redirect you to Protopy Cloud where you can start recording the interactions. And of course, uh, yeah, sharing your handoffs. And yeah, so we also have, um, Sorry, we, we have like different examples of, you know, amazing prototypes that you can do with Protopy. So if you have not downloaded it yet, I really encourage you to do so. 
And if you already have it, then you can start also uh, learning more. And yep, I think that'll be it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, everyone, you can check all of our product updates more in detail on our um, on our blog page. Um, we have everything in there. Okay, now it's time for uh, Nathan to take over the stage and let us know how they prototype for the connected home at Vivint. I will stop my share again. And yeah, Nathan, the stage is yours. Look forward to your presentation. Great, thanks guys. And I'm really excited about the custom fonts feature. I've been wanting that for a long time. <laughs> so thanks for releasing that. Can you guys see my screen? Great, thanks. Yep. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here and share uh, my experience using Protopie. Um, I'll be walking you through uh, an experience we created uh, that was very complex and helped us gain confidence um, in the designs and helped our users gain comprehension of the product and uh, its comp complex features. Uh, again, my name is Nathan Moss. I'm a senior UX designer at Vivint. And at Vivint, we create a fully integrated smart home. So this includes traditional home security system, um, outdoor and indoor cameras, uh, smart lighting, smart thermostats, smart locks, et cetera. Um, and the team I work on specifically works on our camera and video experiences. And I'm gonna walk you through an experience I created while working on the Outdoor Camera Pro and Spotlight Pro products. I'm going to start out by introducing these products. Um, they're very unique and have been revolutionary to the smart home industry. <clears throat> so um, the majority of crime that's going to happen at your home is a crime of opportunity. Um, mainly it's people breaking into your car, stealing a bike from your driveway, uh, things like that. And uh, a problem we found with traditional security cameras is that even if someone got recorded committing a crime, um, the chance of them getting caught was very slim. Um, being able to ID someone just from camera foot footage is hard um, unless they're a known criminal or they get caught doing something else. And then the police can look at your footage and be like, I think this is the same guy. Um, so most of these uh, crimes also just aren't big enough for the police to put a ton of effort behind. Um, so these crimes are pretty low risk for criminals and they also know it. Uh, we have footage of people looking right into a camera and then stealing stuff out of someone's car. Uh, they don't necessarily care that there's a camera present. Um, so how can we help the customer with this problem? Uh, through a lot of research and innovation, we created a feature that actively deters unwanted visitors called deter mode. Uh, when a user has deter mode turned on, the camera lights up and it plays a tone if someone lingers on your property for too long. Uh, this feature was very successful and it contributed to creating our North Star, which is don't just record crime preventer. Now the following is real footage from my outdoor camera pro. Uh, this happened at about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I woke up the next day with this notification. Uh, this guy uh, was walking through. He's looking through a woman's wallet. He throws some like, lipstick and stuff on the ground here, and uh, then he goes over to my car and starts looking around to see if uh, there's anything of value. Now, I think the, the audio isn't actually working, but... Uh, you can see him get startled. That's when the whistle happens. Uh, he gets startled and then he looks directly at the camera. So two things happen. He doesn't break into my car. And two, he looks directly into the camera so we can get a picture of his face just in case uh, uh, we need to share that with the police. Um, so we know this feature was very successful, but we also know that it's not perfect. Um, as you can see in this video, uh, this guy took his time. Uh, he was looking in my car um, before he got deterred. We have videos of custom, from customers of people being inside their car, rummaging around uh, when deterred goes off, and then they go running. Um, so 
there's there's room for improvement. And we started ide ideating to see how we can make the term mode better. One solution we came up with was a new product that supplemented our current Outdoor Camera Pro. Um, we did a lot of field research and we found that people were placing the Outdoor Camera Pro near their motion detected spotlights because they believe that the spotlight would help the um, camera deter better and, and see better. Uh, so they're already combining these two products. Um, so in comes the Spotlight Pro. Um, by adding the Spotlight Pro, uh, it made it unlocked an even greater deterrent uh, capability. So this Spotlight has nine different LED zones uh, attached to the current camera. And so these LED zones are paired with analytics that are in the camera, and it allows us to shine a spotlight on a person and follow them across your property. Uh, so as soon as someone enters the property, uh, the light will turn on and follow them, uh, acting as a light deterrent. And then if they don't leave, we can still escalate deter like we did before by playing the original deter, town, uh, deter sound and then adding a new deter light sequence like a strobe effect. So here's a video of a customer that a customer submitted of this guy going through and checking car doors. As he walks up to the second car, spotlight swings around and spotlights him and he takes off running. You can see on the right side of the video, the neighborhood cat also took off running. <laughs> um, so it's deterring them before they even get a chance to get into the car, which is a huge improvement. Uh, so that was a little intro into the Spotlight Pro and how it became a thing. Uh, there was a lot more research and iterations to that product before we landed on uh, what I just showed you. But as you can see, it's a very complex product and a very new idea. Um, the next challenge was to make sure that our customers understood the product and how to use it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk through uh, how to onboard uh, the Spotlight Pro. So with all of our cameras, we have an onboarding flow that helps educate the customer on how uh, the product works and how to configure that camera. Um, I wanna start out by saying that we could have easily started prototyping this in a different tool like Figma or something like that. But I always start out uh, prototyping in ProtoPy because it's, it's easy to do something simple, but I know as I iterate and test, uh, I need to create a much more robust prototype. So I just started in ProtoPy because it makes it very easy to evolve over time. Um, so the first step here was to take our current onboarding template and then input the Spotlight Pro content and test it out to see how it worked. Um, and then, so you can see the prototype right here. We have this upfront education that the customer can swipe through. They get some quick little animations I made uh, to kind of get the point across to see if uh, this was a good path. So you can see, kind of read, see some animations, swipe through, and then you get the option to set up the camera. So they'll go ahead and name it. Uh, they'll go ahead and outline the detection zone. They'll choose what we call the deter countdown, which is how long we wait till we deter someone. Uh, go through and choose the deter light sequence. Um, what tone we want to play, and then they can go through and schedule the tour mode as well. And then they get a quick little summary that tells them what they chose. Uh, failed miserably. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was obvious that this wasn't going to work after listening to a couple uh, tests. Uh, Spotlight Pro, it's a very complex product and it's difficult to understand at first glance. Uh, we found with this flow that people were swiping through the upfront education uh, because they just wanted to get to setting up the camera and they thought uh, maybe they were tech savvy, they understand how cameras work, uh, they didn't need the education, they just wanted to set it up. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Michelle really quick and she's gonna just talk about this uh, this page. 
So what you're seeing here on the screen is just a spreadsheet of the testing results that we got out of our initial testing of that initial prototype. And this here is the worst case scenario that you can have for a product. You'll notice nines and tens over on the right hand side and a bunch of red on the left hand side. Uh, those nines and tens are a quantitative way to capture qualitative feedback. Any experience that we try and ship here at Vivint, we want to make sure it's easy to use. So users self-rank, how easy was that to use? How uh, interested are you in this product? Um, how much do you understand this product or how much do you feel like you understand this product? How likely would you be to recommend that setup experience if uh, if it worked, if the product worked as you were shown today? And so nines and tens on the right and a bunch of actual failure on tasks on the left. So another thing that we test for is ensuring that customers actually comprehend the product, that they're actually succeeding in their tasks. And so uh, here on the spreadsheet, you'll see we have failed, 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 failed on all of this. And uh, when a customer is confident that they know what the thing does, but they actually fail in the task, that is your worst case product scenario. So we wanted to make sure that one, we could streamline the product experience for setting it up and also make people more educated on it. Yep, exactly. Uh, these testers, like Michelle said, they were confidently wrong. They loved it. They thought it was very easy to set up. They had no idea what it did. Um, so uh, we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and rethink how we onboard cameras uh, so we can better educate them and make sure that they're still setting up the cameras how they want to. There you go. Um, so in parallel, while I was working on the onboarding for Spotlight Pro, Michelle was also uh, testing out the settings for Spotlight Pro. Um, she was the lead designer over the Spotlight Pro product as a whole, and she came up with a very creative way to explain and configure an experience. Um, we call this the Mad Lib. Um, it's a written sentence telling the user exactly uh, what an experience does with a few inline pill buttons that allow them to change the specific settings. So for this ex uh, specific experience, deter mode, uh, if someone steps into my detection zone, when deter mode is on, my spotlight will follow them. If they stay longer than six seconds, the light will strobe and a whistle tone will play. So it spells it out for them and then they can go tap on those pills uh, to update those settings. Uh, the excitement around this feature was amazing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and play a quick soundbite from one of our testers. And I really, really love the... Just kidding. I know the audio isn't working, so that's not going to work for you guys. So I'll just go ahead and move on. But basically... Actually, was... It, was, it was working, so you can go back to it and it say... It was? Okay. And I really, really love the um, settings where it's just spelled out in a sentence. Like, I don't think I've ever really seen that before. That's amazing. I really love it. Yeah, so uh, just like that guy, we got a bunch of sound bites from other testers that were very similar. Never seen this before, but really loved how easy it was to understand. Um, so for the next iteration, we went ahead and included the Madlib in onboarding to see if it would work there as well. And after testing quite a few different iterations of this, uh, we found that adding like a strong visual to the Madlib really help the customer understand the story even better. So uh, we came up with this idea to have our customers build their own deter story. And to do that, um, I combined the Mad Lib with a custom animation that shows exactly how deter mode is going to work based on the settings they chose. And I'll walk through that experience in just a second. Um, but I wanted to say first that this builder experience would really be impossible to prototype and test without Protopy, or it would have taken a lot of dev work to actually code out a prototype that works like this. Um, so I'm confident saying that this experience would look a lot different uh, if we had to use a different tool. Um, so uh, with this builder screen on the left, you see that Mad Lib. On top of that is a video, that custom animation I was talking about. As they tap on the different pill buttons, uh, different bottom sheets pop up where they can choose uh, the specific setting that they're looking for. Um, so when they change the deter tone, uh, different tones will play that they can hear, and then it will save to their experience. 
And I'll show you really quick here. So uh, this video outlined in red, that's the space we're talking about now. Uh, we had to use a lot of variables to keep track of the settings that the uh, customer was choosing. And then um, as they set up their settings, they could tap the preview button to see exactly how it's gonna function. Um, so on this slide, you can see if they tap the will follow, uh, will follow them uh, pill button, they get two options of videos. They have a tracking video or a no tracking video uh, based on their selection. So that video will play for seven seconds. And then as soon as that video ends, it switches out and plays the de deter light video and the deter tone at the same time based on the setting they chose. So we automatically uh, switch the videos out and we stitch together uh, like their exact experience based on, on the settings. And to do that, we use a lot of variables and conditions throughout the whole process. So now I'm gonna walk you through like the final onboarding experience. I kind of showed you uh, bits and pieces, but I'm gonna show you it all stitched together so you get the full experience. When a customer gets a Spotlight Pro installed on their system for the first time, they open up the app, go over to the cameras tab, and they're gonna see this camera card that says, get started. As they tap on that, they're gonna get a splash page that says, welcome to your Outdoor Camera Pro. And then we write out exactly how Deter Mode works. Your light will spotlight and follow visitors once they've entered your detection zone. And after a duration of your choosing, your camera and light will react to deter unwanted guests. They tap show me how, that fades away. And then we show them a video exactly how it's supposed to work. And this video shows the default selections. So if they skip past making any other selections, that's how it's going to work. Then they can go in and outline their property now that they know what happens when someone crosses into that zone. And then that video scales down uh, to that builder page that I just showed you. And then they can go in and make some settings. So maybe they're on a busy street and they actually don't want the spotlight to follow anybody. They can go ahead and choose no thanks. There's a little video here showing what uh, this selection actually does. And then maybe whistle is a little too aggressive and they wanna change it to a more friendly tone. They could choose friendly, go in and save that new setting. And lastly, strobe can be disorienting. So maybe they go through and choose a different one. And you can see the video update to show exactly what we mean by wave and circle or flood. And they go ahead and hit save. And now if they're happy with that, they can go ahead and preview this new experience to see what it looks like. So now you can see this guy walk through the detection zone. He's not getting followed. It plays the friendly tone now and does a full flood. And now if they're happy with that experience, they can go ahead and save that or they can make more changes. Now they get the option to schedule the turn mode so it can turn on automatically. They'll go ahead and name it. This looks like a driveway, so that's probably the best option. Then they get a chance to uh, opt into data analytics if they want to help us create a better model uh, that's smarter. And then finally, we get this summary page that shows them, again, a full experience of exactly how it's going to work on their system. And they can go back and change it if they don't like it at this point. Uh, but we do this by using variables and tracking this across many scenes um, and using different conditions. So it's very, very powerful. And then uh, I'm just going to walk you through one example of exactly how this works together. So um, like I said, a lot of variables and conditions, and I use a lot of um, send and receive messages within Protopy. I like to use these messages uh, to contain related responses. So this example you see on the screen now is part of that summary page, uh, that last screen. And what happens is when the summary page launches, uh, it sends a message to the scene saying play tracking, and that will start the video. And based on the tracking selection, selection if they have tracking uh, on, then we'll show the tracking video, we'll hide the no tracking video, 
and then we'll instantly start playing the tracking video. Once the tracking video is finished, we send two messages to the scene, one to play the deter tone and one to play the deter light. And then secondly, if they don't have tracking selected, then we hide the tracking video, show the non-tracking video, and then play that non-tracking video. Same thing, once it's done, we play the correct deter tone and we play the correct deter light sequence. The section at the bottom here, we're tracking the, um, the deter light variable. So the strobe, the flood, the wave, and the circle. Based on those videos, they're not the same length. So we needed to make sure the progress bar that uh, goes across the bottom of the video uh, scaled across the correct amount of time. So based on strobe or flood, it changes how fast that bar scaled. So that's how it's built. Um, that was a very small section of how the prototype is built. There are a lot of sections just like that throughout all the scenes. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to briefly discuss how we test with ProtoPie. Um, for usability, usability testing, we do a lot of testing through usertesting.com. Uh, we can target our current customers as well as people that represent who a new Vivint customer could be. And we could get in front of a lot of people uh, relatively quickly. Uh, we typically start the test by launching a prototype and then placing the user in a scenario. So on this screen, this is exactly how we're setting up the test for this um, Spotlight Pro onboarding. The first task is the ProtoPie opens. And then we say, imagine that you've decided to purchase outdoor camera and Spotlight Pro as part of a larger security system that you can arm and disarm. You've just had your security system professionally installed and now wish to accomplish a few tasks. On this screen is a prototype of the mobile app. When you see the prototype, move on to the next step. That last sentence uh, we found to be very important because sometimes if people had a poor internet connection, the prototype wouldn't be fully loaded and they would just move on to the next task and completely skip the prototype and basically fail the test. There was no way for us to get meaningful data out of that. Um, and then the second task, once they see the prototype, they move on to the next one and we put them in this scenario. So it says, put yourself in this scenario. This camera was just installed on your home. You need to finish setting it up. Please set it up how you would want it to work at your home. This sentence we found was also very important. In early testing, we found that people were talking in hypotheticals. They said, well, this is a great product. If I lived in a place that was dangerous, this is what I would do. But that's not the data we wanted. We want to know exactly how people use it on their home. We want them to think about it on their specific house so we can get data for all types of people in all types of neighborhoods. And then lastly, Michelle uh, talked on this a little bit earlier when you saw that spreadsheet, but this is how we asked the comprehension and uh, quantitative questions here. So this top section is the comprehension questions. After they go through onboarding and they finish onboarding, the next task is uh, to ask them some, some of these follow-up questions. So the first one's like, imagine it's 10 p.m. and deter mode is on. Someone enters your detection zone, verbally explain what will happen. And we're checking to see if they really comprehend the Spotlight Pro. So ideally, what we would hear is someone enters my detection zone. The light continues to track them uh, for six or eight seconds, depending on what they selected. And as soon as that ends, the camera played the whistle tone and the strobe, the light strobe. If we heard that, we would mark that as a pass because they comprehended exactly how it was going to work and how they set it up. So we asked them a couple comprehension questions like that. And then we asked them to kind of scale it out of one, or, uh, one to 10. Depending on the test, we asked we could ask different questions. But this was like, how easy is it to set up? Um, how useful do you think this product would be at your home? How interested would you be in getting this product? And then uh, how likely would you be to recommend this product if it works as uh, you've been shown today? And then we can track all these questions across all the tests. And for this specific camera, uh, 
experience, it was, you know, 150, 200 tests when we finally finished it all. Um, so it was really nice to quickly be able to scan it and make sure we were making meaningful progress. Um, it's not the only way we use protopy to test. Uh, we've done a lot of in-person testing as well. Uh, we've also used protopy Connect in the past uh, by connecting, uh, controlling one prototype with another prototype, uh, which is very helpful as well. So um, there's a lot of ways to test with protopy and they make it relatively easy to do so. Um, so again, um, that's all I have for you today. Uh, protopy honestly is the main reason that this uh, experience became a reality. Um, but I'll go ahead and pass this back over to the team at Protopy and we can get into the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan, for this insightful presentation. Uh, like Nathan mentioned, we will now head over to the QA and try to answer some of um, some of your questions. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to read some of the questions out loud and then either Michelle or Nathan, I'm going to pass them over to you. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to start with the very first question. I know, Nathan, you mentioned something briefly about using Connect. So do you utilize Protopy Connect to enable cross-device experiences with Vivint's hardware, particularly during the initial login process for carrying the camera with the app? We have only used Protopy Connect a little bit. Um, I haven't used it specifically with our hardware yet, uh, but one experience we did do when we were first launching deter mode, um, we wanted, we were doing in-person testing and we didn't want to keep taking the phone from the customer as we take, uh, as from the tester, as we tried, uh, we gave them new experiences. So what we did is we gave them a phone with a prototype on it. And we had another prototype that had like six buttons, one for question one, question two, question three, question four, whatever. And we were testing notification copy and then other experiences. So as Michelle was interviewing the tester, I would pop up a new notification that the customer would then get haptic feedback on and would get like a, a real reaction. Like it was, a, it was a, a real notification that they were getting. And then Michelle would be like, okay, how did that make you feel? Um, so it was a really, it was like a remote control uh, for the experience we were testing out, which was really fun. Awesome. I hope that covers it for the person that asked. Thank you, Nathan. Now let's take the next one. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, a super insightful presentation. Uh, you mentioned you could do prototyping work that the developers otherwise had to iterate on, uh, on through code. How much time? and resources do you expect that you save with Protopy? So this person, yeah. Speak to that a little bit. Um, our developer resources are very limited. And so there is a little bit of preciousness around using their time for prototyping or for using their time on experiences that aren't validated. Uh, so we have in the past developed experiences that weren't fully validated and spent several months iterating on things that ultimately didn't make it to the customer. And so this ultimately saves uh, our developers a lot of iteration and experimentation time. I can't quantify it for universally, but for every particular product, there is a significant time savings there. Yeah, and to add on that, um, I mean, we were doing other things at the same time as this. This was my main project, but I would say it probably took us from beginning this project to like handing it off to devs was five to six months um, because we did so much testing because it was a very complex product. So if you take that amount of time and then have developers actually build that out, um, it would have been a lot longer, I believe. Thank you, Nathan and Michelle. Um, let's see, next question. How many designers in your team used Protopy and how was the onboarding process like? Um, yeah. All of us, our designers on the team do have access to Protopy. We do have a few people who are more skilled than others. And uh, honestly, our onboarding process is Nathan. Nathan's our resident expert right now. And he puts on a lot of uh, seminars and training sessions to help educate the rest of the team. Yeah. And we have 
12 designers um, on the team. I've started a new thing where I create um, like small short videos on how, how to create like a specific interaction that we use within the app. So maybe how to page or like how to show and hide bottom sheets, things like that. And those have seemed to be helpful, helpful for the team as well. I would say, honestly, the best thing is to just get into it. If you're using Figma to do something, go build it in Protopy and like get used to the tool. Once you start learning about the variables and, and the power of Protopy, um, you'll switch over, I think. Amazing. Do you guys uh, use Protopy School? Like, do you refer to some of the tutorials that we have on Protopy School or, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely used Protopy School when I'm stuck on something or um, someone, I think he's an ambassador for you guys now, but it's uh, the Protopilot videos. Um, I watch a lot of his stuff because he goes really in depth on formulas and like really useful uh, stuff you use day to day. So, Right. Shout out to Darren, our ambassador <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to remind the audience that we have brought up by school, we have the, the documentation as well. So yeah, thank you for thank you for that. Let's see. Uh, this question is coming from Upa Das. Nathan, how much time did you spend on building the prototype and testing it out with customers? How did you propose to convince this to your senior leadership? That's an interesting one. What was the last part of that one? So how um so how much time, first of all, how much time did you spend on building the prototype and testing it out? And how did you uh, convince this to your senior leadership, to your stakeholders, your senior stakeholders? Well, luckily, Michelle was my senior, senior leadership, so she helped convince people. Um, and also testing out like uh, Spotlight Pro onboarding with the current onboarding template. We showed that to leadership how poorly that did and, and how people failed on that and they realized that we need to like uh, make it more complex but we need to like change that and and really test it out because everybody knew it was like a very new product and it was it was a hard thing to to grasp um as far as making the prototype uh, I, like i said before like testing it we did i think it was close to 200 tests on the onboarding flow um and it took probably five to six months. If I were to build this prototype from scratch right now, and I knew exactly like the final product like, that we have that we shipped today, um, it would probably would take um, maybe like a full week, forty hours or something to to build that uh, very complex product. Maybe going into two weeks. And speaking to the last portion of that question, uh, I know that testing and validation isn't always in the DNA of every company out there. Uh, sometimes they're like, hey, just give me a design. Let me give it to the to our developers so we can build it and ship it. Uh, but showcasing how designs fail and showing that to executive leadership is a way for you to get more buy-in into greater validation. And it makes the end product much better in the end. Um, it's great to ship products, but it's better to ship great products. Thank you. Some really great tips there, Michelle and Nathan. Right. Um, so another question is about how long did it take for you to become comfortable using Protobuy? How did you go about learning? Do you have any tips to get proficient in Protopy? I'm a, a experiential learner. Um, so I just kind of had to get in and do things. So just a little background. I started at Vivint as an intern and I was tasked to like start. We were testing out Protopy to see if we can build certain interactions. So I started out just kind of building micro interactions in Protopy. And I think what, what I wouldn't say I was comfortable at all, but Michelle wanted to test out this deter experience. And I was like, Protopy can do that. I don't know how, but I know, I know it can do that. So I spent like a couple of weeks trying to build this Protopy for Michelle. And I ended up like the night before in-person testing. I was in the office till like 1 a.m. <laughs> trying to get this to, to work. And it, it worked out. So. Um, I think 
it really depends on how often you're prototyping. I definitely like go, it, it ebbs and flows. I'll be prototyping for, you know, three, four months, and then it may be six to eight months before I do it again. Um, it's it's hard to say. I, I would say just kind of get in there and then you'll get comfortable with the basic tools, build something basic. Like when we started out, um, we were using Envision. That was the main tool. Um, and you build a flow prototype, build a flow prototype and protocol. See how much easier it is doing that. And then once you build that flow prototype, start adding functionality, functionality to it. Get used to the basics and then you can start getting the variables and conditions and things like that. Awesome. That's really, really great to know. And that also covered your question, Regina, about how um, Nathan's workflow was before Protopy. So you mentioned you used the uh, Envision, right? Before uh, yeah. taking over. Yeah. And basically, as I was like uh, in school, we use Envision a lot. But as soon as I started at Vivint, I started exploring Protopy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's see. This is a question regarding um, Dev Handoff. So super insightful to follow the workflow and your process. I learned a lot. Uh, since introducing Protopy will change the designer developer handoff, what did your developers say about it? Uh, were there welcoming or any concerns from their end? I'll talk about handoff. Um, we've recently implemented a new handoff process here at Vivint so that we're handing off products and experiences more consistently across our team. And that does happen largely in Figma. We haven't used a lot of the um, robust handoff documentation in Protopy yet, but uh, the way that we hand off, we could very easily like, integrate that pretty seamlessly. The handoff process that we have developed has been nothing but a godsend to our developers. They absolutely adore it. Uh, it answers all of their questions. They are able to build things faster. There's not as much back and forth or ambiguity. So uh, the handoffs have been much better since we implemented the new process. Yeah, and, and on that, we always include links to the protopy, the protopy and uh, talking about just dev handoff within protopy. I've used interaction, the interaction library before to hand off specific components. I found it useful to that, like, hey, this is how a component animates in and out. And it shows like a very condensed, like, hey, this is the timing and things like that. And I've got uh, very positive feedback with that because they can see exactly how it's built. Right, so you mentioned you used uh, interaction recordings from within Protopy, the, the handoff, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I've used that before specifically for like our design system. So if we have like, this is how a bottom sheet opens up and closes, or this is how a toast bar uh, asks, I've used it for those kind of things. Right, yeah, so I think with Protopy, the whole uh, handoff, process is getting easier and easier and now that you can also do narrations while you're recording preview I think it's getting we're improving this process more and more uh, with each day okay thank you for that let's uh, let's uh, go to the next one uh, Nathan did you have coding experience before or did you get this advanced only based on a designer background thanks for an awesome presentation so uh, no I would say I have um I have more of a, like a logical uh, brain, like a developer brain sometimes a little bit. Um, I actually, for school, like I didn't do a normal design school. I went through like a, um, a boot camp, uh, but initially I was planning on doing some sort of dev boot camp. Um, so no, I didn't have any coding experience. I've done like a little HTML and CSS before in JavaScript, but no, not really. Uh, Protopy makes it, uh, pretty easy to understand and and use. Right. So a coding background is not like a prerequisite for using Protopy. Yeah. It definitely uh, brings some, it helps. Right. Yeah. Let's see. Daniel Lee is asking, to what extent do you think Protopy enables designers to explore and express their creativity? I've heard that Protopy allows for the use of voice triggers and various other features. Yeah, I haven't used the voice trigger stuff yet. Sounds pretty cool. We don't have like uh, voice actions with Vivint yet. Um, but I think one thing, again, I'm a visual learner and like I have to, if I'm thinking of something, I have to visualize it. And 
I've done that very quickly by creating a quick prototype uh, in Protopy. If I want to see like, hey, I want this like unique micro interaction or like I want this thing, like what if this did expanded like in this way, what would that look like? And I've used Protopy just to test out those interactions and animations uh, without having to dive into After Effects or something like that. Um, so not necessarily actually building any sort of prototype to test out, but just testing interactions and animations and things like that. I think it's been really uh, useful to, to build on the creativity of the team. Awesome. Daniel, I hope that answers your question. Uh, let's see. Uh, would you recommend using Protopy as a newbie freelancer? How popular or in demand do you believe it is right now? I'll talk about uh, this one. Um, yeah, really, any way that you can get the most realistic experience into the hands of a user or a client is the best for being able to communicate your design, your vision. And Protopy is the product that we have used that has been able to give us that high fidelity. So it's less about the tool, it's more about the end product, but Protopy is fantastic and is the thing that has allowed us to create these experiences that are as close to reality as uh, they will be when they're built. Yep, and on top of that, like, like I said before, you can do very simple prototypes in Protopy. You don't have to get super advanced with variables and conditions. Uh, so as a newbie, it's it's not a hard product to, to understand and to start with. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, let's see. How um, What are the top features you are currently missing in Protopy? Custom fonts I was missing <laughs> until the most recent release. I actually don't know if we have an enterprise plan right now or not. We do uh, not. We don't? Okay, well, when it comes to the plan we have, I'm excited about that. Uh, custom fonts has been a huge request from me, and I know other people in the Protopy community. Uh, because you run into issues, like if I use our custom font, Vivian font, you run into an issue where the prototype is now showing the system font, and it's extending past the text box you have. So it's cutting letters off or it's wrapping weird or, or creating some weird things in, in the prototype when they view it online. Uh, so I'm very excited about custom fonts. It's been uh, an amazing addition. Right, so indeed custom fonts is currently available only for our enterprise users. However, Google Fonts is coming for our pro users. So Nathan, you will be able to use it uh, later this year. Yeah, I can give you like an exact uh, deadline for that, but uh, it's coming. So yeah, stay tuned Yeah, <laughs> for that. All uh, right, so uh, one final question. If you guys had a web uh, web app, would you still be using Protobuy? Yeah, totally. Um, I've done some other, we have, so with our system, yes, we. Most people control it through the mobile app, but we also have like a panel that's mounted to the customer's wall. Uh, that's like a small iPad size. So I have created prototypes for the panel specifically um, that are uh, different than a mobile app. So if I had a web app, I would totally use Protopy as well. You get uh, just as much benefits for the web as you do for a mobile app. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so we have one final question, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit about that. Um, so if we had to work on a in a passion project, what kind of project would let us show off all the prototyping power of Protopy? Um, well, I guess that's really up to you to decide. Uh, we already established that Protopy does enable your creativity. So um, yeah, it's up to you to kind of let your creativity flow. Nathan, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, I mean, what I would love to play around with is like um, designing like a screen for a car, you know, that interacts with like the Logitech steering wheel and like those kind of experiences would be super fun to work on um, and like explore just how like the steering wheel controls the the screen and the car and things like that uh, would be really fun and definitely show off like how powerful protopy is. 
Right. So that is all like automotive, automotive prototyping is one of our biggest areas of, of work. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe Rebecca or Patricia or someone from my team can share some of our like blog articles, use cases about how to use, uh, you know, that whole uh, multi-device cross-device interaction with Protopy Connect for automotive, for building, you know, um, HMI or all types of interactions for, for, for automotive. Okay, uh, let's see. I think I'm gonna look through the chat to see if there's any more questions. Um, thank you so much for covering all of these questions. Um, if you can, if you, we have five minutes left, so um, yeah, so amazing, amazing presentation. A lot of um, a lot of praise for 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 you and uh, and Michelle. Um, right. So if we don't have, okay. So Arthur is asking. If you're on Twitter, <laughs> uh, uh, no, not on Twitter. No. I mean, I think I have an account, but I'm not on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. I use it sometimes, but feel free to reach out and connect with me there. I'd love to chat about Protopar. Okay. Or anything else, really. So, one final question is whether you use Arduino with Protopar Connect to test out device mobile interactions. Have you been using Arduino? I haven't yet. I've brought it up um, to some of our hardware engineers before, and they're interested in testing it out. Uh, we do something called like Innovation Week, which is a uh, a week where we can get together and and create uh, products that aren't really prioritized. Um, so I've talked about a couple of those things with uh, hardware engineers before that I like to test out and and um, see how that works. But we haven't done anything yet with it. Okay, Avey, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so I think we need to start wrapping up today's session. Again, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Michelle, for graciously uh, handling all of the Q and A's. Now, um, yeah, so like with all of our webinars, uh, as a token of appreciation for your time and participation, uh, we offer a discount code. Uh, you can use this code uh, during checkout to get 30% off our uh, monthly and yearly pro plan. Uh, right, let's see. Um, yeah, the webinar schedule is ongoing for the rest of 2023. Our next webinar is about prototyping for a medical device. So the team at Sunrise Labs is gonna talk to us about how they use Protopy in their workflow to, to design products that make uh, lives better. So please feel free to register. Someone from my team will share the registration link. It's totally free. All of our webinars are free. And yeah, you can get some really, really great insights about medical device uh, prototyping. Um, I would encourage all of you to join Proto Pioneers. It's our online community. Uh, it's the perfect place to get help, to interact with fellow Proto users and share ideas and just become better at Protopy and uh, at uh, design and prototyping in, in general. So feel free to check it out and join. Um, okay, uh, yeah. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. A big thank you to Michelle, Nathan, and Rebecca for, uh, for their presentations. Um, thank you, Michelle and uh, Nathan for covering the Q&A and for providing us with all of these great tips. Uh, yeah, and the big shout out to the Protopy team. To, to my team for, um, for their support. Yeah, I hope to see you at our next webinar with Sunrise Labs and medical device uh, prototyping. So yeah, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah.